welcome poets, poetry jurors, and poetry aficionados. My name is Carla Schmidt, and I have the honor of serving as one of the assistant directors of the Pennsylvania Center for the Book, and as the administrator of the Lee Bennett Hopkins Award for Children's Poetry. This afternoon, we conclude our one-year celebration of the 20th anniversary of the Hopkins Award by presenting the 21st award to our honored guest, Kate Coombs, and starting a year-long 21st anniversary celebration. This is a very special luncheon today with many special guests. We have two winners of the Hopkins Award to read poetry. We have the founders of the award, and we have at least one juror from all 21 years. We'll also hear a poem from every one of the winning titles. Before we have lunch, we will give you a sampling of our afternoon by hearing poems from six of the seven books that won the Hopkins Award before it moved to Penn State. To start our brief pre-lunch section of our program, it's my pleasure to introduce Barbara Dewey, Dean of the University Libraries and Scholarly Communications at Penn State University, and the host of the Pennsylvania Center for the Book, in Pennsylvania. Barbara. Thank you so much, Carla, and welcome everyone to this very special program. It's going to be a very exciting afternoon. I feel so fortunate to be part of Penn State University Libraries as Dean, and I have to brag just a little bit because our accomplishments are many. According to the most recent reports for 2013, we rank eighth among North American research libraries, public or private, as measured by the Association of Research Libraries Investment Index Rankings. Only Michigan among the Big Ten schools ranks higher, and we know that in service and other things, we, we rank much higher than Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason for our success and I think you would agree, is our people, our faculty and staff, they are key ingredients in this recipe of accomplishments. They are the reason we have an outreach award that is celebrating its 21st anniversary here this afternoon. And I would like to recognize several people for their important contributions to the Lee Bennett Hopkins Award and the Pennsylvania Center for the Book. First, sitting among you are members of the Children's Literature Council of Pennsylvania, the organization founded in 1984 to promote and celebrate children's literature in central Pennsylvania. Your efforts laid the groundwork for today's Pennsylvania Center for the Book, and your existence made possible the, the creation of the Lee Bennett Hopkins Award. Would those of you involved with the council as writers and administrators please stand and be recognized? I would also like to add my sincere thanks to award founder Lee Bennett Hopkins. Lee wasn't able to be here today. Hello, Lee, if you see this video. No, I'm thinking about you. But he is here in more than spirit. He will be delivering his own message after lunch. And when you hear it, you will know why I offer my gratitude for his past support and for the amazing future he will, make, he will be making possible. I would like to also recognize my predecessor, Dean Emerita Nancy Eaton, Nancy and Stephen brought the Pennsylvania Center for the Book Track to life. And thanks to her sponsorship these first 10 years, it was thriving when I arrived. And I think one of the first meetings I had as new dean was um, uh, Stephen arranged a meeting about the, the Pennsylvania Center for the Book. And I was on board immediately. Thank you so much, Nancy, for your efforts. And we have one last group to recognize, last but not least, however, our Pennsylvania Center for the Book staff. Nicole Miyashiro, Eloise Ingram, Jenny Litz, and Caroline Wermuth 
Our two assistant directors, Elisa Stern Cahoy and Carla Schmidt, and our director, Dr. Stephen Herb, please stand and be recognized. Thank you all for your hard work all year, each and every day. Thank you all for coming, and I know that we were, we we're going to have an exciting and enjoyable afternoon. And Carla, I think I'm calling you up to the podium again. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. We're going to start with our poetry readings, and I'd like to introduce Richard Ammon, children's book author and associate professor emeritus of education from Penn State Harrisburg to read the second winning poem from the second winning book of the Lee Bennett Hopkins Poetry Award. This is from Nancy Wood's Spirit Walker. It's a woman's lesson. A woman's lesson is a simple lesson. Whatever life asks, answer with love. A woman's lesson is a wise lesson. Whenever conflict threatens, go forth in harmony. A woman's lesson is an enduring lesson. Whatever is taken from you, give back in generosity. A woman's lesson is a gradual lesson. Whenever there is a storm, remain a calm center. A woman's lesson is a courageous lesson. Whenever there is despair, sow the seed of hope. A woman's lesson is a practical lesson. Wherever there is dryness, go and get the I'd like to introduce Barbara Glenn, former classroom teacher and educational consultant. I'm going to read The Bat by Douglas Florian in his book Beast Beast, and it won in 1995. The bat is batty as can be. It sleeps all day in cave or tree. And when the sun sets in the sky, it rises from its rest to fly. All night this mobile mammal mugs a myriad of flying bugs. And after it's night out on the town, the batty bat sleeps upside down. <laughs> it's my pleasure to introduce Sarah Willoughby Herb, who was uh, taught me how to reach young children, to let them love literature and books. And I used that in my parenting and in my teaching. And to my joy, I watched my children use it in their parenting. Thank you, Sarah. I'm going to read The Grandparent Glide from Dance With Me by Barbara Juster Esmondson, illustrated by Megan Lloyd. The book won the prize in 1996, The Grandparent Glide. The music, big band. She flashes a glance. She holds out her hand, and they dance. Her light hand on his shoulder, his arm round her waist. They stop growing older, their fingers high, tight laced. Slowly their toes print a dance on the rug, and everyone knows when he gives her a hug. How can they tell when to stop, when to start? I know him so well. I know her by heart. I'm pleased to introduce Barb Miranak, who's an associate professor of reading at Mount St. Mary's College in Emmitsburg, Maryland. I'm going to read The Blue Wildebeest. And this particular poem is my favorite from the winner of 1997, Voices from the Wild by David Bouchard with paintings by Ron Parker, The Blue Wildebeest. If they ask you, I'm a mother. That's the purpose of my life. It's the thing that keeps me going. It's my only goal in life. When our herd is seeking water and I sense a danger near us, that's the time you'll see how special is the gift I have of scent. We might be several hundred thousand searching for fresh water when the lion slips beside us, crouching, waiting for a stray. I have always and will always know my offspring by its scent. From the time of birth till always, I will know it by its scent. In 400,000 like it, I will find it by its scent. That's my answer, that's my entry. That's what scent can do for me. And I need it for more than any. That's what living means to me.
introduce Elisa Stern Cahoy. Is an she is an education and behavioral sciences librarian at Penn State and the assistant director of the Pennsylvania Center for the Book. She is also the 2014 chair of the Lee Bennett Hopkins Poetry Award. Thank you so much. I am reading Winter Swing from The Great Frog Race and Other Poems by Christine O'Connell George. This was the winner in 1998 pictures by Kate Kiesler. Mine is really short, it's a haiku, that's why I'm telling you that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Winter Swing. The old wooden swing hanging from the apple tree is pillowed with snow. And now it is my honor to introduce our next reader, Lisa Etzweiler, is an English teacher at the Central Dauphin High School in suburban Harrisburg. I'm reading the preface from The Other Side by Angela Johnson. This book was in 1999 winter. When I was very young and had just begun to write, I considered myself a poet. In my self-centered 14-year-old world, poetry was immediacy and spoke to longing, loss, hope, and absurdity. You could not tell lies when you wrote poetry. Poetry was sudden impact and the truth. Poetry was odd characters in sometimes odder circumstances. I didn't understand Meter, but I knew what I felt and what I saw. And because I was very young, when I thought myself a poet, there were no barriers. My poetry didn't sing the song of the sonnets, but then I sing a different kind of music, which is what it's all about anyway. Thank you, everyone. Weren't those poems wonderful? so wonderful to listen to poetry read out loud, in particular. We're going to have lunch now. Richard Ammon and invite him to come to the podium. He'd like to um, give us a tribute of Nancy Edwards, one of the founders of this award. When I was thinking about Nancy, and I, I, had, I had a lot of snapshots, um, little clicks here, little clicks there. And so I put all of those little clicks together um, to form a kind of a little homage here. Maybe it's a Syrah homage. And I think that these, these are, that some of these references are so personal that only Ruth and Amy will get them. But uh, here we go. Uh, click. Nancy was one of my students. Click. She was also one of the original organizers of this uh, group who brought together the information of for the Children's Literature Council. I well remember those formative meetings in the basement of the East Shore li uh, Library behind uh, the Columbia Park Mall. Click. She was one of those sunshiny people uh, who, if her house burned down, she would have said to Reed, oh, look, we can build a new one. <laughs> she referred to, often to her children as Amy people pleasers. That was a compliment, yes. However, she did possess a sharp wit. Once when I was leaving the conference in Hershey, I opened the door to find Nancy and Lee Bennett Hopkins coming in. I must have made a fuss over seeing Lee because Nancy blurted out, what am I, chopped liver? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I knew Nancy and Reed well enough to know that once you had a car that didn't run so well, um, I don't know if you remember that, it was a real lemon, and it was, uh, yes, it was, <laughs> it had an emblem shaped like a bow tie, right? Yes. My memory's pretty good there. Nancy um, was one of the first people to invite me as an author to present at her school, 
And while I had hosted many authors at Penn State Harrisburg, I had never really witnessed an author giving a school presentation. And I don't know why I was so naive, but Nancy thrust me into this auditorium filled with elementary school kids. <laughs> I don't know how I made it through, but after, after, right after that, I said, drive me home immediately. And we did, and I don't know what I collected up in my office, and I went back and made it through the afternoon. So I, I really am so grateful to Nancy that this happened in front of her and no one else. <laughs> I clearly remember when Ashley Bryan came to our um, campus, Penn State Harrisburg, and Nancy asked to have breakfast with him to work on her charity. Lee, I think you'll remember uh, a, a NCT conference in Indianapolis. Uh, uh, there was a session chaired by you, and Nancy uh, gave a spirited and enthusiastic presentation. <coughs> that spring, and I don't quite recall, recall the occasion, but I took to um, I took Nancy to Alfred's Victorian. Um, for those of you only familiar with the uh, Center County campus, um, I want to tell you that Alfred's Victorian. That was supposed to be a joke. Center County campus. <laughs> We're from Penn State Harrisburg. Thank you. Um, Alfred's Victorian is a five-star upgrade um, restaurant, and so we had a wonderful lunch. And as we parted, um, I said, um, let's do this again next year. And she gave me a big hug. So that's my tribute to Nancy. Here, here. Thank you. picture of Nancy that we discovered in our archives <laughs> and she's holding the very first check that Lee Bennett Hopkins sent for the very first award. <laughs> and we're honored to have Nancy's family here today. Reith and Deb and um, Amy, thank we're, you for being here. Thank thank you. You. Our next speaker couldn't be here today because he is working in Poland as a Fulbright Scholar. When the Hopkins Award came to Penn State, it began as a partnership with Dan Hayes, Associate Professor of Language and Literacy Education in the College of Education. Dan was instrumental in expanding the award from its regional beginnings into a truly national presence. The juries began to include nationally known scholars, poets, publishers, and teachers Winning books began to mention the award on book jackets, and the awarding of honor books started. The Hopkins Poetry Award was showcased at Dan's wonderful Children's Literature Matters conferences at the Penn Stater, and I know we all miss that wonderful conference. Elisa Hopkins is here. She's the Assistant Professor of Education at Penn State, and she brings greetings to all of us from Dan in Poland. Dan is sorry he couldn't be here today to congratulate Kate, hug his good friend Ashley, and to share in the joy of this event. He writes, hello to all of you at this celebration of 21 years of poetry for children. And to Ashley, I'm sorry I'm unable to be here this afternoon. It's been far too long since we've been together. Some of you know that a large Ashley Bryan painting from the first Hopkins Award winner hangs in my home. The storyteller, and I treasure all that it represents, both friendship and a shared passion for outstanding literature for children. It has been my pleasure to be connected to this important award and to share the books that it has highlighted with our students in the College of Education. Among all the forms of literature available to children, poetry has the potential to be the most powerful, the most transforming. These days, teachers are being presented with serious challenges by Common Core reforms, which emphasize informational literature and on reading for explicit meaning. 
poetry is not informational literature, nor does its metaphorical nature lend itself toward reading for explicit meaning. Poetry is about images, voices, and feelings. Our mission must be stronger than ever to share poetry with children more widely and to influence the next generation of teachers to care as passionately about poetry for children as those in this room do. Congratulations to Kate, Ashley, Lee, and to all of you sharing in this wonderful event. A few words from Stephen. Those of you who are following the program closely may notice that I inserted myself earlier. Uh, we, uh, we, you know, when you plan these things very carefully, you, you realize, well, we don't want to do all the credits and thanks at once. You know, we still would be waiting to eat. So I have a few more to do. Perhaps you've not noticed, but the Lee Van Hopkins Award really has had three thirds, and we've embarked on our fourth. It can't be a third, so I guess we're moving to quarters now. But the first third was with the Children's Literature Council of Pennsylvania. And there are some of the founding members here. You just heard a tribute, a memorial to Nancy Edwards. Uh, Barbara Marinette is here from that group, Lisa Etzweiler, some of the other founders, but who were very, very active in that. And I thank them for all their years in getting this going, especially after I left town to come to Penn State. Um, but then they sent the award with me eventually, which was very nice. And uh, then we have the years with Dan and the College of Education. And I wanted to recognize the years that we had with the Pennsylvania School Librarians Association Conference. That third third, represented by some of our jurors here today and some of the former members, including the president. And I just wanted to thank you and ask for a round of applause for PFLA. <laughs> also, in our program, you'll notice that we kind of have the current sponsors and the current setup. But, but if you look at our website, you see the CLC and the College of Education and PSLA as well. Uh, it's hard to keep up to date with the paper, but you can always do that on the web. Um, we also want to acknowledge, uh, in addition to Lisa and Barbara and Nancy and Dan, um, I wanted to mention Carla Schmidt, our wonderful administrator. Funny little look. I'm sorry. That's right. And uh, and you already <laughs> you also know about Barbara Dewey and Nancy Eaton, our former deans. I also want to acknowledge Lisa German, our associate dean, and who supervises uh, our work, and uh, we fall under her department. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> and um, I'd like, if you wouldn't mind, to have all the jurors, uh, if you've ever been a juror on the Hopkins Award, to stand. Just for Chairs, too. Thank you. And if you've ever been a volunteer, by the way, I was standing. If you've ever been a volunteer for the Center for the Book in any capacity at all, I wonder if you could also stand. I have a composer. I have workers. I have volunteers. I have wow. Megan Gilpin. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sarah. 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 Suzanne Samrock and, and Megan Gilpin, uh, in particular, I do want to point out uh, for their wonderful work with us. Um, Suzanne got this started and never dreamt she'd be going to another job before it was over. So, but Sarah, she still is. And to Sarah, who's been an inspiration to everything we've ever done for children. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to mention uh, three people who have departed, um, in addition to Nancy. That's Lynn Welsh, our colleague, who was very active at the beginning of the CLC. Barbara Espenson, uh, the poet uh, who wrote uh, the Dance With Me book, our third winner. And just this last year, Nancy Wood, who was our second winner uh, for Spirit Park. So um, just to acknowledge their passing. And don't tell me I covered it all. I think I did. What do you think, Carla? Pretty good. Thanks. <laughs> All right, I'd like to introduce Joanne Foss, the retired executive director of the Lancaster County Library System, who is our next reader. I'm going to be reading Taking My Son to His First Day of Kindergarten by William Crowley. It's from the anthology What Have You Lost by Naomi Shehab Nye, the winner for 2000. As the 8 o'clock bell spills its racket into this mild September, it is I, not he, who hesitates in the clamor toward the open doors. 
who spots the little ruffian throwing rocks at the trash master by the swings, who shyly searches for room 106, where Miss <coughs> waits with the name tags. The halls still gust and flow with the rush of new dresses, the scent of denim and sharpened pencils. Eighth graders arrange themselves in craft groups to tower in their nonchalance, eyeing each other like springers at the blocks. Near 106, a bulletin board declares the season of changes above a paper grove of sugar maples. He pulls me on, then runs ahead, fearless, blameless, gone. And um, I'd like to introduce my friend Marge Tassia, who's Professor Emerita of Children's Literature from Miller School University. The poem I'm reading is from a book, Light Gathering Poems, edited by Liz Rosenberg, 2001. And the poem was by Michael Glazer. A poem ending with a preposition with. You can fail love, but love will never fail you. An idea is so luminous, so, so amazing, that most of us have to make up conditions. Thus, love comes free, but not for you or me. We have to deserve it. We have to be worthy of it. And thus we live for the if of ever wondering always whether we have failed again or have somehow earned what was always there to begin with. The next poem is by Marjorie Maddox Haver, a professor of English and Creative Writing at Mount Haven University. And I'm going to be reading To Each His Own by Anna Gross Nicole Hines, the 2002 winner, from Pieces, A Year in Poems and Quilts. It's very appropriate for today, I think. To each his own. When the leaves fall, some float lazily, wavily, and taking all daisily, drift to the ground. Some flutter, scuttering, wuttering, audibly uttering whispers of sound. When the leaves fall, some come in bunches, swirling and twirling, twisting and whirling, round about round. Some skip a dip, bippity, floppity, flippity, toppity, tippity, flippity down, and some just drop, flop. <laughs> <laughs> and I would like to introduce to you uh, Marcia Bowers, who is a retired professional storyteller and a registered thematic movement therapist. I'm reading to a salmon falls from Splash by Constance Levy, illustrations by David Solon. She was a 2003 winner. Through foam you leap, a silver twist uncurling as you fall, you miss, and try again, up into the swift downrush of water wild and furious, you fling yourself more bird than fish, to hang an instant in the air, again you miss. I stand there peering through the mist of, at water, white as winter snow, watching you try. I hope you know, I wish you luck and quick success, brave, shining, silver salmon fish. Next, uh, I wish to introduce Anita Beats, as head of children's services for the Sklo Central Region Library and State College. I'm reading When I Grow Up. It's the 2004 Ben Hopkins winner from the Wishing Women Letter the Poems, written by Stephen Mitchell, illustrated by Tom Thor. When I Grow Up. When I grow up and I am wise, I'll know if needles shut their eyes, if shadows dance, if worms have knees, if bears say, bless you, when they sneeze. When I grow up and I am old, I'll know where secret tales are told, where dreams are born, where dragons fly, where ladders lean against the sky. And when they think that I am dead, I'll know who puts the moon to bed, who lights the stars, who lifts the sun, who leads the planets one by one. Uh, I'd like to introduce Janice Dyser. She is the retired library department head and a librarian from the Central Columbia Middle School. Um, I'm reading Betty Pointing, 64 Clerk, from Karen Harlan, Poems and Many Voices by Walter D. Myers, which was a 2005 one. He asked me why I smile when I say I love you. I don't know why I smile, I just do. He said I shouldn't smile when I say it, because then he don't think I'm serious. I've been with him 46 years, and I told him that should stand for something. But he still said I shouldn't smile when I say I love him. 
so I got myself all tidied up and looked him right in his face and said, I love you. But no sooner than the eye was halfway out, I was smiling again. I just can't help smiling when I say it. I truly can't. I smiled the first time I ever seen that man standing in the back of the church trying to ease out before the service was over. <laughs> Even when he ain't around, sometimes I find myself thinking on him and smiling. So now, I'm standing in front of the mirror, feeling like a fool, saying I love you to myself for practice. So when he comes home from the barber shop, I can say it to him. And I know, same as I know my name, that when I open my mouth to say it to his face, I'm going to be smiling. Shoot, he know it too. <laughs> uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Monica Wagner, a fifth grade teacher at Westerly Parkway Elementary School in State College. I'm going to read This Thing For Me from Song of the Water Boatman and Other Pond Poems by Joyce Sidman, illustrated by Becky Crane, and winner of the 2006 award. Listen for me on a spring night, on a wet night, on a rainy night. Listen for me on a still night, for in the night I sing. That is when my heart thaws, my skin thaws, my hunger thaws. That is when the world thaws and the air begins to ring. I creep up from the cold pond, the ice pond, the winter pond. I creep up from the chill pond to breathe the warming air. I cling to the green reeds, the damp reeds, the muddy reeds. I cling to the slim reeds. My brothers are everywhere. My throat swells with spring love, with rain love, with water love. My throat swells with peeper love. My song is high and sweet. Listen for me on a spring night, on a wet night, on a rainy night. Listen for me tonight, tonight, and I'll sing you to sleep. And I'd like to reintroduce Elisa Hopkins. Assistant Professor of Education and Children's Literature here. This is from Walter D. Myers Jazz, illustrated by Christopher Myers, 2007. The poem is Now I Come In. There's crazy rhythm in the drums. You can feel it when it comes. It's so cool. You can hear the bass man humming as his fingers start to strumming, his steady stroking in a music pool. The piano's come alive, and I know that she'll be driving through the night. And it's so right, you know, you know. And now I come in. This warm is my heart, and I've got to play my part. That takes you to another place and time. This melody from memory makes harmonies that reach to be so much more than a simple tune or rhyme. I'll take you as far as I can go. I'll blow as hard as I can blow. I'll reach for the stars, blow notes around Mars, and then you come in. And then you come in. I'd like to introduce Becky Frost, former K-4 elementary school librarian at Central Columbia Elementary School in Pittsburgh. The bombing of the 16th Street Church in Birmingham, Alabama was recently in the news. As the four young girls who were killed in that incident on September 10, 1963, posthumously received the Congressional Gold Medal. The 2008 E. Bennett Hopkins Poetry Award that year went to a narrative piece based on that day of the bombing and is entitled Birmingham, 1963 by Carol Boston Weatherford. The day's events are told by a young girl who has just turned 10. It was not only her birthday, but she was to sing her first Youth Day solo during the church service. I've selected two excerpts from this work to share with you. The day I turned 10, someone tucked a bundle of dynamite under the church steps, then lit the fuse of hate. The day I turned 10, there were no birthday cake with candles, just cinders, ash, and a wish I were still nine. And I, <laughs> before I sit down, 
am pleased to introduce a very good friend and the current president of the Pennsylvania School Libraries Association, Eileen Kern. And I have the honor of reading an excerpt from the narrative verse Diamond Willow by Helen Frost, the 2009 winner. This is from the ending of this narrative story that actually is in two parts. You can read the poem one way through, and then you read it the second time through, reading only the bold-faced words. Sorry, I only can do it one way. <laughs> A perfect trail, a perfect day, new snow, quiet, dry, sparkling, the kind that doesn't hurt the dog's feet. The days are getting longer, warmer, nearly 20 above instead of 20 below. I'm running all six dogs with Cor and Roxy leading the team like two wings of a swan. I feel I'm flying with them. Like my twin sister Diamond is alive inside of me saying, Willow, this is happiness. Me, these dogs, this snow, the spruce hen flying just above us, this is happiness I see. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Dustin Brackville, a librarian at Mount <coughs> Nittany Elementary School here in State College. But I must warn Dustin, I hate to tell you, Dustin, but every juror who has been on the Lee Bennett Hopkins Award has turned out to be a PSLA president. <laughs> I didn't see that coming. I get to read the song of Heartbeats Galoshes from Button Up, Wrinkled Rhymes by Alice Shirtle, illustrated by Petra Mathers, the 2010 winner. This is a marching song. When it's raining, Harvey always puts us on, puts us on. We're together when the sunny weather's gone, weather's gone. Oh, there's mud up to our tops. We hope Harvey never stops making deep, wet footprints in the lawn, in the lawn. Squash, glosh, squash, glosh, through the slime. Squash, glosh, squash, glosh, bet a nickel, bet a dime. That the worms are squirming too, for we wish we'd squish a few. <laughs> when it's raining, don't we have a lovely time, lovely time. <laughs> I'd like to introduce Barbara Bartels. She's assistant director of the Child and Family Services for the Baltimore City Head Start program in Maryland. And a really hard act to follow. <laughs> Thank you so much. I am so thrilled to be here today. And I do get to read an excerpt from the narrative verse from the Ink Garden of Brother Theo Fame. This is by C.M. Millen, illustrated by Andrea Wisniewski. And this is awarded the award in 2011. Theo Fame worked at his simple brown desk with simple brown writing like all of the rest. But Theo Fame just couldn't help but observe outside his window, the flight of a bird, or the green of the tree on a hill far away, or the sun shining brightly on the top of his page. And then he would stop with his copy and chore to write all about the beauty outdoors. I get to introduce Mark Foster who is um, the American Association of School Librarians Affiliate Representative for Pennsylvania and a retired school librarian from North Allegheny School District in Pittsburgh. It's my pleasure today to read from Wonton, a cattail told in haiku by Lee Wardlaw, illustrated by Eugene Yelchin, and it was the winner in 2012, which I was privileged to be the chair of the committee that year. It was wonderful. Uh, I'm reading today a uh, part called The Feeding. Sniff, snuff, what is this stuff? True, I liked it once. That was then, this is now. <laughs> Fine, if you insist, I'll try just one nibble. But I won't enjoy it. <laughs> what do you mean, you? How is my tuna breath worse than peanut butter? <laughs> Sorry about the squishy in your shoe. It must have been something I ate. <laughs> now we head back to Carla. Thank you, all the wonderful readers. Let's give one last round of applause for them. It's 
my pleasure now to introduce Sue Kimmel, who is an assistant professor um, at Old Dominion University in Virginia. And she is going to talk about this year's award and the folks that she worked with and present um, the award. Thank you, Carla. What a remarkable afternoon um, and a delightful celebration of poetry and especially poetry for children. The National Lee Bennett Hopkins Poetry Award is given annually to an anthology of poetry or a book of single volume published for children in the previous calendar year by a living American poet or anthologist. It's co-sponsored with Mr. Lee Bennett Hopkins, Penn State University Libraries, and the Pennsylvania Center for the Book. 2013 marks the 21st anniversary of this award. And I would like to recognize my fellow committee members. And this was um, not work on our part. <laughs> it was great fun and great joy. Um, and as a criteria, which I um, invite you to read up here on the poster, it was a year of, um, of beauty and truth in uh, looking at these poems. And truth often comes in a, in a light, humorous, um, notice we've been reminded this afternoon as well. Um, and so my committee members, one we're so fortunate to have with us today is Joyce Dietrich, elementary librarian, Greencastle Antrim School District of Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. Go ahead and stand up. <laughs> Wait. Um, and we uh, we're a national committee, and so we have members from around the country. Mary Ann Fallis, Librarian, Irving Public Library System, Valley Ranch um, of Grapevine, Texas. Mark Scarp, fifth grade teacher, Eden Prairie, Minnesota Schools of St. Louis Park, Minnesota. And Lee Wardlaw, the previous award winner, um, children's book author, and 2012 Lee Bennett Hopkins Award winner for one time, Cattail Told in Haiku of Santa Barbara, California. And it is my distinct pleasure <laughs> to um, introduce our winner this year. She made her work very easy. And that is Kate Coombs for her book, um, Water Sings Blue. Kate, if you'll come up, I'd like to present you. With this really gorgeous award in the shape of a book. <laughs> chance to talk about poetry. So. Um, but I want to start by saying what a privilege it is to be here with Ashley Bryan. I had already owned and read some of his books, and when I heard he was going to be here, I uh, read his autobiography, Words to My Life Song. A marvelous book, a marvelous poet and illustrator, a marvelous life. I also want to thank Lee Bennett Hopkins, who has given poetry, the gift of poetry, to so many children. Now, some beautiful things are big. The Grand Canyon, a forest, the sky. But some beautiful things are small. A firefly, a leaf, a seashell. A seashell is an amazing thing. It's a small fortress, a piece of ocean pottery, an art project made by a snail that extracts calcium from seawater for its building materials. A seashell is like a poem, compact and shiny. And of course, a poem is like a seashell, small, precise, and well-made. A poem is an encapsulation of wonder. And so we have this poem about the winter moon from Langston Hughes. How thin and sharp is the moon tonight, how thin and sharp and ghostly white is the slim, curved crook of the moon tonight. Or this one from Valerie Worth, whose book is appropriately titled All the Small Poems, Hollyhocks. Hollyhocks stand in clumps by the doors of old cottages. Even when one springs alone, lost in an uncut field, it builds beside it the cottage, the garden, the old woman, the beehive. Here's one from Christine O'Connell George, September. Sniff the air. It smells spicy, sharp, like freshly sharpened pencils. Poets love words, and so do readers and listeners. 
How many four-year-olds have thrilled to those immortal words, Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall, Humpty Dumpty had a great ball. How many have loved lines like this one? I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house down. Or hundreds of cats, thousands of cats, millions and billions and trillions of cats. <laughs> How many middle grade kids have laughed at this poem by Shel Silverstein? It's dark in here. I am writing these poems from inside a lion, and it's rather dark in here. So please excuse the handwriting, which may not be too clear, but this afternoon by the lion's cage, I'm afraid I got too near. And I'm writing these lines from inside a lion, and it's rather dark in here. <laughs> Maybe when these kids were a little older, they read novels in verse by Sonia Soames, Ron Kirchie, or Helen Frost. Maybe they wrote, they wrote their own poetry as teenagers, because a poem can also be a knife, a power drink, a friendship bracelet. A poem can be an encapsulation of feelings, like loneliness, fear, and love. Maybe, being teens, they just listened to hip-hop and pop songs, some of which had better lyrics than others. Maybe they went on to read poems by Billy Collins, Mary Oliver, Pablo Neruda, William Shakespeare. Maybe, like one of my students whose life was a morass of troubles, they read poems by each other. As I have gobbled, adored, and quivered with poetry over the years, I have tried to write wonderful poems of my own, small and tightly made. I am not Langston Hughes, I am not Valerie Ward, or Shel, Shel Silverstein, but I am pleased with my ocean poems, especially since they are displayed at their very best thanks to Milo So's shockingly lovely artwork. Let me read you some poems from Watterson's Blue. The book begins by putting out to sea in song of the boat. Push away from the stillness of the nut brown land, from the road that leads to the shore. Push away from the town with its tight tree roots, from its closed brown shutters and doors. Push away, heave ho from the heavy brown pier, from its pilings huddled and dull. For the water sings blue, and the sky does too, and the sea lets you fly like a gull. Since sharks and whales usually get far more page time in a collection of this type, I took pity on the sand and wrote Sand's story. We used to be rocks, we used to be stones. We stood proud as castles, altars, and thrones. Once we were massive, looming rings, holding up temples and posing as kings. Now we grind and we grumble, humbled and gray, at the touch of our breaker and maker, the wave. My favorite sea creature is the jellyfish. I wrote not one, but three poems about jellyfish, including this haiku. Deep water shimmers, a wind shape passes, kimono trailing. I rewrote shark over and over, <laughs> especially one rebellious word in line six. He circles and stares with a broken glass grin. His body's a dagger. He has lion's tongue skin. He slides through the water like a rumor, like a sneer. He's a quick twist of hunger. He's the color of fear. Now, I tend to prefer quiet and logistic poems, but I did write some funny ones. My editor prefers those. <laughs> <laughs> the hermit crab turned out to be a realtor. Ocean Realty. My name is Frank Hermit. Here, take my card. So you want a house with a porch and yard? I have listings for periwinkles, whelks, and rental traps. Turbans, tops, and moon shells, a palatial comp, perhaps? That one's not available. I'm waiting for the snail to vacate his townhouse and put it up for sale. <laughs> but this place has a deck and a nice view of the land. Beachfront property is always in demand. <laughs> the sea turtle poem was a last minute addition. After a friend who heard about the project exclaimed, Oh, Benjamin Lana, sea turtles! I couldn't bear to tell her son that there was no sea turtle pond. Here it is. There's a wide green map on sea turtles' back. Currents, she knows, their flows never slows, needn't stop for directions wherever she goes, flapping her elegant, paddle-shaped toes. The book ends with a goodbye in tideline. Ocean draws on the sand with trinkets of shell and stone, the way I write on the sidewalk with a stick of chalk at home. She signs her name in letters, long and wavy and clear, saying, don't forget me, I was here. 
was here, was here. So, there's a reason my grandmother memorized dozens of poems. The same reason I read poetry when I was supposed to be studying for finals in the university library. <laughs> Those of us who love books and language know about this. We can name our favorite poets. We may surprise people by quoting a line or two because something reminds us of a favorite poem. We are sad that Seamus Heaney died last month. It gives me great joy to be here with people who understand that the world is full of beauties, large and small, including the particular beauty of poetry. Could not be here today. He uh, sent us emails last night wishing us well and looking forward to seeing the video of all of this. So um, you're going to hear him say his own stuff here in a minute, but I just wanted to go back to the beginning, um, and that was a letter I received on the 16th of October, 1991, from Lee that said, you know, there ought to be a national award for children's poetry, but there isn't anything like that. And um, I don't know how many places he had tried before he came to us, because we were pretty little. But, uh, but we, we knew, he knew we liked him. <laughs> we knew we were a young hope group. And so he, he said, uh, what would you think of starting that? And uh, we said, I, I wrote back. One week later, those of you who know me know what response in a week is pretty good. <laughs> so I wrote back, wow. And uh, I said I'd have to take it to our board. But I knew what they would say. And Nancy and Barbara and the rest of them said, let's do it. So uh, away we went. Uh, you saw the picture of Nancy holding the check, which was wonderful. They gave us $2,000 to start the award, 500 to the poet, which you'll know has increased Kate uh, in the last several years. And um, he's a very special guy. Uh, he's a, a national treasure poet, anthologist, uh, and the best advocate for poetry probably the United States has ever had. If there's another, it's this guy. So we have one here on live and one on DVD and one future. It's one. Congratulations to all of you. Uh, so we're going to hear uh, a little bit of Lee. He sends a message. Lee Bennett Hopkins. I'm very happy to be here, even virtually, uh, to celebrate this very auspicious, auspicious occasion of the 20th anniversary of this award. Um, I would like to s just talk a little bit about the establishment of the award, which began in 1973 when the Children's Literature Council was formed in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, in 1977, there was only one award for poetry in the United States, the National Council of Teachers of English uh, Excellence in Poetry Award for Children. The award was established uh, to give a poet an award for their aggregate body of work. It was an exciting award because it was, again, the first award of its kind in the United States. However, I felt that there was a need for more recognition of poetry. And thus, with the aegis of Steve Herb and Barb Marinek and Nancy Edwards, a dear, dear, beloved soul, we established the Lee Bennett Hopkins Poetry Award. Uh, it's kind of hard to believe we're in its 20th year, but I would love to take this moment to congratulate Kate Coombs, who is the latest recipient for her beautiful book of poetry, Water Sings Blue. It is also so exciting that Ashley Bryan is with us today. Ashley, of course, won the very first award for his wonderful book, Sing to the Sun. When the book was published and won the award, it was held at the governor's mansion in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. It was a beautiful event with many, many friends and a lot of family. Ashley has been a friend of mine throughout his entire life, uh, a man I love and always will love. After he had won the award, about a month or two later, I received this extraordinary woodcut of his from his book, Walk Together Children. This drawing has been in my home since 1973, 
And of course, I cherish it, Ashley. I thank you again for being so generous. I'd also like to thank the many, many people uh, throughout the country who served as jurors and members of committees uh, over the years with this award. You've done an incredible job. Uh, it involved librarians, teachers, poets, all kinds of educators. Uh, and I'm so appreciative uh, that this award has been established. Uh, funny enough, there are a couple of guidelines that I had set when I established the award. One, I can't win it. And two, I will be the third to find out who does win it. Uh, the calls are made first to the publishing house, the poet, and then to me. But again, my sincere thanks for uh, all the work you do during the year uh, to select the one book and honor books for this award. This also gives me an opportunity uh, to announce that I am giving my entire library and personal files on the over 200 authors, illustrators that I have interviewed to Penn State um, in the future. Uh, Barbara Dewey has been to my home. She's assessed the library. And I'd be very proud that it'll end up at Penn State, particularly since it's the state where I was born, in Scranton. I'd like to close with a poem. Many of you know it. Uh, it's become a signature poem of mine. In a f few words, a few lines, it kind of says all I wanted to say about children, reading, the love of books, the love of poetry. The poem, good books, good times. Good books, good times, good stories, good rhymes, good beginnings, good ends, good people, good friends, good fiction, good facts, good adventures, good acts, good stories, good rhymes, good books, good times. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Wow. 20 years. Lots of memories for many of us that were there in those early days in the basement of the doctor. Um, there are, before I introduce our special guest for the afternoon, um, there are a couple of stories I'd like to tell from those old days if I could. Um, one of them is a public story that some of you may know. The other is a little bit of a private story that probably none of you know. Um, the first one involves um, that very first night that the award was given for the first time, and the governor, we mentioned it, we were in the governor's mansion. Uh, much of that had to do with Lee's roots here in Pennsylvania, and the fact that at the time, Bob Casey was the governor, and Ellen Casey was the first lady. And for those of you that were familiar with the first lady's work, she's an incredible champion of children and reading and books. So when we approached her to hold this event, the answer was an immediate yes. So we were thrilled. I was at the time, along with Barbara Glenn, who's sitting back at that table, um, we were in the Central Dolphin School District. And one of my buildings was West Hanover Elementary School. I was a reading consultant in the building. Took a half a personal day on that very first day that the award was to be given. And so I was in the building in the morning. And as the planning for this went on, I became very close to Ellen Casey's press secretary. I didn't obviously talk to the first lady frequently, but I talked to her press secretary a lot. So that morning, I'm preparing to leave. and my office telephone buzzes, and it's her press secretary on the phone. My heart kind of <laughs> skipped a beat, because for those of you that plan events like this, you think, hmm, is she just checking in to say everything's fine, or is something happening? Well, indeed, something did happen. For those of you that were there that evening, you will recall that her grandchild came down with appendicitis that day. 
and she and the governor were on their way to the hospital to be with their family. And she could not be with us that evening. <gasps> okay, I'm sure, I hope the child will be fine. You know, I, we wished everyone well, but okay. And her press secretary, Jean, said, no worries at all, don't worry. Uh, we have someone that's ready to step in, and it actually was Commissioner Joe Barr. Uh, from, the second, from the Department of Education. He did a marvelous job that night. But Jean's parting words to me were, the First Lady feels so badly about this. She desperately wanted to be there. She owes you. <laughs> the First Lady of Pennsylvania owes me. Hmm. Kept in touch with Jean, and seriously, she meant it. And for the next year or so, everything that we called upon her to do for us, she did. She made appearances, she did public service announcements, she was an extraordinary supporter of our efforts, and we will be forever grateful. That's the public story. The private story is, how many of you were at the governor's mansion that first time, that first night. Anybody remember the weather? <laughs> it poured. I mean, poured relentless. You know, not just rain that comes and goes. It poured for hours. I took a half a day of work, as I said. Went home, changed. New suit, cloth shoes, went to the hairdresser, paid way too much, trailer was longer. Paid way too much for this French braid thing. I was to be the first one at the governor's mansion that evening to welcome the caterer and do all that stuff that needs to be done before the guests arrive. So it's the governor's residence, right? And the governor and his family are guarded here in Pennsylvania by the Pennsylvania State Police. So, and obviously we were on the list <laughs> to be welcomed into the mansion that night. But remember, please, that the governor and his family were not in the residence because they were at the hospital, right? So when the governor and his family are not in residence, you don't have as many police protecting. There's no one to protect, just the house. So I approached the gate, and there was indeed a Pennsylvania State Trooper. I'm Barb Marinac. We know. Great. Just ushered me right in. Pouring buckets. Remember that pouring buckets, pulled in, parked the car, two big doors, if you're familiar with the governor's residence here in the state, two big doors, ran up to the door. <laughs> no one answered the door. Okay. I'm not even sure people that were there that night, my friends know this story. Uh, there were multiple doors. I literally ran all around the governor's mansion trying to gain entrance into this building. I went back to the little booth where the police officer was. He's gone. Remember, there's nobody to guard, okay? I literally ran around the building until I finally got to a loading dock area where the caterers were unloading, had unloaded. And you had to pull yourself up in, onto this loading dock area. <laughs> New suit, hair, cloth shoes, pouring buckets. I'm pulling myself up onto this loading dock. At this point, I'm desperate to get into the building. I'm pulling myself up, and I hear this voice behind me say, can we help you? <laughs> I turned around. There's a second police officer that was at the residence with his on his hip. Y'all know what they keep on their hip, right? <laughs> what can we do for you? I'm supposed to be in there. After some fast talking, he did invite me in. I got into the building. While you were all making your way into the building, I was in the ladies' room drying myself off with the first lady's hair dryer, <laughs> trying to make myself presentable. I don't think anyone knows that. Or, or even realized it unless you were walking beside me and you heard my shoes. Ashley Bryan brought to the sound of his mother singing from morning to night, and he shared the joy of song with children ever since. Ashley was born in Harlem and raised in the Bronx. 
He recalls his childhood in New York during the 1930s as a magical time, full of art and music. One of his fondest childhood memories is his family celebration when he published his first book at age five. <laughs> Kindergarten. A limited edition. Alphabet <laughs> book. Ashley has been drawing everywhere for as long as he can remember. In New York, at home in Maine, and in France. During World War II, Ashley Bryan sketched the soldiers who followed him onto the beaches of Normandy. Ashley Bryan has been the recipient of the Coretta Scott King, Virginia Hamilton Lifetime Award, and the Laura Ingalls Wilder Award. He has also been a May Hill Arbuthnot Lecturer and the Coretta Scott King Award winner. But he is also the keeper of firsts. Though he was not published until he was 40 years old, Ashley Bryan was the first African American to publish a children's book as an author and an illustrator in 1962. And on Tuesday, March 23rd, 1993, in that pouring rain at a ceremony at the Pennsylvania Governor's Residence, Ashley Bryan received the first Lee Bennett Hopkins Poetry Award for his collection of palpable beauty, Sing to the Sun. Please join me in welcoming Ashley Bryan. Oh, what a joy it is to be with Kate Coons and her, her beautiful book, which I hope to take along with me. Just look at the pictures so far. But I'm in mean, such wonderful company. Oh, hearing all the recitations of poetry it means so much to me that you celebrate poetry. And my book of poems, Sing to the Sun, which the first, is hard to find now unless you're looking for it in Japanese, because it's <laughs> most recently done in Japanese. <laughs> back as good as in English. So it's hard to find in English. But um, it meant so much to me to be recognized that. Uh, with that award, Lee Bennett Hopkins being such a dear friend. I begin, I will end with a few of the poems from Sink to the Sun, but I'd like to begin, as I usually do, with black American poets. And I always hold a book when I read, and I don't have the books with me. I don't want to travel all those books, because I don't want to pay that extra baggage fee. <laughs> <laughs> but I just bring some close changes, that's all. <laughs> but I did bring my, see, I'll hold it as if I'm reading from everything. Because I like the children to know that whatever my voice does, it comes from the printed word in the book. And I always begin with a poem that affirms the love of who we are and the love of our people. And I ask everyone to say with me, My people! My people! By Langston Hughes! By Langston Hughes! The night is beautiful! The night is beautiful! So the faces of my people! So the faces of my people. The stars are beautiful. The stars are beautiful. So the eyes of my people. So the eyes of my people. Beautiful also is the sun. Beautiful also is the sun. Beautiful also are the souls of my people. Beautiful also are the souls of my people. That always brings us together, so I begin with that poem. <laughs> and I go on with um, opening up the different um, ways in one can work with words on a page in poetry. Of one that we lace along with, maybe I'll do the lines and use mother to son poem, one of his, um, where this mother is urging a boy on. Mother to son by Langston Hughes. Well, son, I'll tell you, life for me ain't been no crystal stair. It's had tacks and it was flinted and bulbs torn up in places with no carpet on the floor. They, uh, but all the time, I've been up to line it on and reach and lanterns and turning corners and sometimes going in the dark where there ain't been no light. And so what, don't you turn back? 
Don't you sit down on the steps because you find it's kind of hard. Don't you fall now. Because I still go in, honey. I still climb in. And life for me ain't been no crystal stage. I try to give them the variation of voice, that words in a page more poetically. Sometimes it's a quiet voice, and sometimes the voice is rhymes. So when there's a poem that's in a favorite of my friends, and Sue asked me about that, I'm to that baby by my Sue And this is the loudest poem. <laughs> Because then I can smuggle. Because then I can 
tune so cool like a Greenland jazz. School of fish. School of fish. Pool as a dish. Pool as a dish. By the diver under to fish and suck, they smack their beaks when they come up. So many to treat. So many to treat. What else did they eat? What else did they eat? After the fish ate worms for a snack. Right claw forward. Right claw forward. Left claw back. Left claw back. <laughs> uh, just a few words of my book that came out this month. Uh, can't scare me. I wanted to have something very rollicking of a little brown boy for my 90th birthday. And so I worked on this last year and it managed to get it together. My editor, uh, Caitlin Lewis, she's, she's very good with me because it, sometimes she's working on with me just a few months before the book is actually to be printed up. When you can have to have it a year, a year and a half in advance. But when she wanted to get this out of time for my 90th, she stayed with me into February, making sure that it was as good as could be. And in this book, it's a little boy. He's very bad. And um, his parents can't raise him, so they send him to the grandma. Because they know that love and stories are going to be a great thing for him. So he's with the grandma, and she told him stories about the giants. And to never be out late, because if you're out late, they're going to catch you, and they will eat you. But he's not afraid. He said, you can't scare me. I'll escape from any old drive, one hit, two, or three. So he's supposed to be helping her in the field. But he goes out after he slips away. He's in the tree. And he's playing his flute. And he's singing. And then he climbs down from the tree. The sun is going down. He's playing. Toodle -loo 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 -loo. Canto, canto. I'm wild. I'm free. Then my stone bees can't scare me. I'm full. I'm brave. I may be small. No many headed giants get me at all. <laughs> so this body swing he skips along, and of course he bumps into the two headed giants. <laughs> and the giant says, Oh little boy, I love your little song. Keep playing. How I love it. I could listen all day long. So he goes ahead and he bumps into the three headed giant. And the three headed giant is so interesting, he's singing. Everyone with me. Tanto, tanto, I'm wild, I'm free. Tanto, tanto, I'm wild, I'm free. Grandma stories can't scare me. Grandma stories can't scare me. I'm bold, I'm brave, I may be small. I'm bold, I'm brave, I may be small. No many-headed giants scare me at all. No many-headed giant scares me at all. And giant three says, oh, little boy, I heard your flutin' song. Keep playing. How I love it. I could listen all day long. And he plays and he says, um, I'd like to hear that song again. Hop up on my big toe. My six ears hear much better when you come in close. You say you're not afraid? Or is that just a boast? The boy, to show he had no fear, hopped to the giant's toe. The cedar giant tapped his knee impatient for the show. The little boy sang and played his flute. Toodle-loo-loo-loo-loo. Toodle-loo-loo-loo. Tanto, tanto, I'm wild, I'm free. Tanto, tanto, I'm wild, I'm free. Grandma stories can't scare me. Grandma stories can't scare me. I'm bold, I'm brave, though I may be small. I'm bold, I'm brave, though I may be small. No many-headed giant scares me at all. No many-headed giant scares me at all. So now you the little motif. The giant says, if you hop up on my toe, then he's going to say, will you hop up on my knee? You must agree six hairs, but you'll hear much better if you hop up on my knee. So you see this only thing you hop on the knee. Then the giant says, you know, I'll hear so much better if you jump up on my chest. And so the boy jumps up on the chest, the boys from the giant's side, and leap into the air and plop down on the giant's chest to prove that he had no fear. He sang a song and he played his flute. Toodle-loodle-loodle-loo! Toodle-loodle-loo-loo! Tanto, tanto, I'm wild, I'm free! Tanto, tanto, I'm wild, I'm free! Grandma stories can't scare me! Grandma stories can't scare me! I'm bold, I'm brave, though I may be small! I'm bold, I'm brave, though I may be small! No many-headed giant scares me at all! No many-headed giant scares me at all! 
giant three-inch plastics in and tapped him on the back and snatched him off his burly sack and threw him in the, back, in the sack. Thank you so much, Ashley. What do you think? The spectacular start of the 21st year of the Lee Bennett Hopkins Poetry Award. And our 21st winner, Kate Coombs, is here to receive her award. We're very pleased um, that Ashley and Kate will be signing books outside of this room. They'll be sitting at the table where you picked up your name tags, and the books are for sale on the other side. Um, they'll be autographing those books. Um, but don't scare me, book. And Water Sings Blue, and we also, Megan Gilpin, maybe you want to stand, Megan, so everyone knows who you are. She, we have a really wonderful exhibit of the, Lee Bennett, the 21 years of the Lee Bennett Hopkins Poetry Award at the Sidewater Commons in the Petit Library, and Megan has agreed to take folks over to look at that exhibit. I hope um, you'll enjoy it as much as I enjoy putting it together. It was wonderful to read about these past years and the folks that worked on the award and the ceremonies from those past times. And there's some little trivia bits that you can learn about this award through the years by looking at the use of it. And then we also have a, a nice exhibit in the, um, El the Pennsylvania Center for the Book, Elko, which is in the Paternal Family Reading Room. And it has some archival materials that some of you might be especially interested in looking at. The original letter that Lee sent to Stephen asking um, about starting the award and some other wonderful um, materials that I think are just really fun to look at. So thank you everyone for coming. You've made it an especially wonderful day. Thank you so much.